Hello, my name is Joe Silk. Um, I work on the fine tuning project at Oxford and um, we're going to have a debate now with um, our guest this week, uh, Mario Livio, and we're going to discuss um, fine tuning, the solar system and everything perhaps. So welcome Mario. Mario is um, a former member of the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore, where he was for many years, um, in charge of uh, the science uh, being done there. And before then, um, he uh, held academic positions at different institutions, and is an expert on um, many things, including stars and, um, and exoplanets and other things. So um, let's begin. Sure. Well, the only th I think I would say is that we'll have a conversation, not a debate necessarily. Indeed. At okay. least I hope so. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Okay, so life in the universe. Um, some people think um, that uh, we only have one example. Others uh, would debate that and say there are infinite numbers of possible uh, civilizations out there. Where do you stand on this? Well, at some level, I hope that there are other civilizations because I think if there is, we are the only one, then th that feels very anti-Copernican to me. I mean, namely, you know, Copernicus taught us that we're nothing special, and I would like to believe that because everything else we've seen showed that we, we are really nothing special. So I would like to believe that there are uh, many other civilizations somewhere, uh, but at the same time, it is true that uh, observationally so far we only have one uh, so at this point you know I'm in a state where I would like to try to explore this question and find out the answer so Fermi um, famously said over a lunch one day apparently uh, where are they um, well where are they if there are many others right so so his argument was a little bit like this that if there are many advanced civilizations in the galaxy, then it shouldn't take them too long. And one can make an estimate, and I think his estimate was something like, you know, no more than about 10 million years for such civilizations to actually colonialize, or at least get to all other places in the galaxy. And in that case, maybe we, we should have seen some sign of those, and we haven't. So that's what, what the nature of the question. Uh, the problem is that, <laughs> uh, many people try to offer solutions to this. And uh, th there are so many different solutions which basically convinces you that there is no good solution because otherwise everybody would have said, oh, that's the solution. And the solutions include from things like, uh, well, in fact, they are here, only they are so advanced we don't even know they are here, uh, to uh, they are so advanced that they know about us, but you know, they don't care about us because we are so in, uh, inferior to them that, and if they don't want, we will never find out about their existence, things of that nature. Uh, two more extreme uh, solutions of the type that there are some bottlenecks in evolution, uh, either in our past or in our future, such that actually prevent civilizations from getting to too advanced because maybe they destroy themselves or whatever. And uh, in that case, you know, maybe we are one of the very few that there are, or all civilizations are doomed at some level and uh, they never reach this extremely advanced stage. So maybe there's an earlier problem, um, which, you know, I think many biologists um, are attracted to and they would argue that the whole sequence of you know building up um, complex organisms, starting off with uh, some combination of um, organic compounds, possibly even primitive protein-like things, but going from there to cellular organisms and more complex things um, is so highly improbable. They would argue um, that um, maybe it is an incredibly rare phenomenon. And after all, you could say, you know, um, it took five billion years um, or thereabouts, four billion years, whatever, for, for life on our planet to develop, which is a hell of a long time. And doesn't that sort of... Um right. So, so you're absolutely right. So that 
would more or less say that this filter or this bottleneck was in our past. For example, let's say in the transition from unicellular to multicellular life. Um, and some people would argue even that this history, as you pointed out, of life on Earth points towards that in the sense that life started relatively early on Earth, uh, namely when the Earth cooled down e enough to, for life to, to be able to start, but then it took a good three billion years for it to develop into something more more complex than that. Um, and so it's very improbable maybe, it takes some very, very special conditions and so maybe it happens very, very rarely and we are lucky uh, to be here at all. I, I think that's definitely a possibility. And then of course you have the um, other factors, maybe slightly more astronomical ones. You know, if there is a supernova nearby, um, if there is a meteorite that hits the planet or whatever, there are destructive events. And um, there's a strong case to be made that there was such a destructive event some 70 million years ago that may have wiped out the dinosaurs. And that's a short time scale, 70 million years. So um, you could imagine going back a billion years or more, there would have been some incredibly um, destructive events, impacts on the Earth that could have been uh, really set, reset the clock completely. I mean, how does that affect your, your estimates? So, so you, you, you're right again. I mean, uh, there have been some estimates, for example, what do gamma ray bursts do to, to uh, life? And, uh, you know, you can actually map regions where maybe w would have had more gamma ray bursts. And there have been papers written. I mean, uh, Piran and Raul wrote, wrote some. Uh, Jimenez wrote a paper, you know, where uh, maybe you can sterilize more or less uh, lots of planets by, by a gamma ray burst and so on. Um, I, I must say I, found, I find these arguments um, not entirely convincing in the sense that I think that it is very difficult to completely sterilize the planet. I mean, I think you can destroy many life forms. Uh, the event you mentioned, you know, about 60 million years ago that killed all the dinosaurs. Yes, it killed the dinosaurs, but it, it was actually that event that allowed mammals and us to actually evolve. So it doesn't necessarily mean that if you have an event which could potentially be destructive, that it annihilates all life forms, but sometimes actually it opens the gate for you know, other life forms and so on. So it, it's hard to tell. I mean, th these things really vary from one place to the next. So this could be the effect of a sterilizing event, such as a nearby supernova. It may be bad, but it almost possibly could be constructive. It might, you know, stimulate um, various genetic mutations. In some places, for that's example, right. which right. Uh, otherwise would not have been encouraged to go forward. That's so right, that's do, right. Do we even know the sign of the effect? No, I don't think we do. No. no. I, I, and and the, the one that, you know, the, the, the thing that uh, the hit the Yucatan Peninsula and killed the dinosaurs is a very good example. I mean, it, it killed very, you know, it, it created a mass extinction, but it still opened the door for the mammals and for us to eventually get there. So I've seen um, two conflicting arguments recently about where to look for um, twins of the Earth, exoplanets. So one argument says that you want to look in regions <coughs> where there are very large numbers of um, um, solar type stars. And this might, for example, be in a globular star cluster or in the central bulge of the galaxy. And a rival argument says no, um, uh, because of um, possibly supernova explosions or whatever, these might be bad places to look for um, uh, life-carrying exoplanets. I mean, wh where should we be looking, in your opinion? I wish I wish I knew, of course, right, but right. Uh, it, it doesn't. It never stopped me from speculating. <laughs> so there is a concept that uh, was invented at some point, which is called the galactic habitable zone. I mean, normally we refer to habitable zone as that region around a star, where which allows for liquid water on the surface. And, you know, because we think liquid water may be essential for, you know, allowing all the chemical elements to combine into complex molecules and so on. But there have been papers written about a similar concept in the galaxy. And usually uh, when people talk about that, 
they actually try to avoid places of high activity. So like near the galactic center, where there are more explosions, more things, you know, and so on, they say that's probably not a good place to look at. And the fact is that where we are, it's two thirds of the way out in the galaxy. Um, so, you know, maybe that if, if you can base it on this one example, maybe we do need to be in a somewhat calmer uh, area. Um, in globular clusters, um, I'm not saying it's impossible, but again, these are environments that, well, sometimes they have relatively low metallicities, um, and uh, metallicity may be important for forming terrestrial planets. Um, so uh, it, it certainly is important for forming giant planets that we already know from the Kepler data, uh, which means to form the cores of the giant planets, you, you need a higher metallicity o overall. Uh, there doesn't seem to be a strong correlation with forming smaller planets uh, with metallicity, but certainly you need some metallicity if you are to form um, uh, terrestrial planets. So uh, I do not know the answer to your question, but uh, given the fact that we do have the one example which exists, I would start by looking at somewhat similar environments.